So the sermon title is The Art of Living Skillfully, like I just mentioned. Um, when we think of life and we think of how fragile the fragility of life and how life is fleeting, uh, the, it begs the question, how should I live or how am I living? When I take an inventory of my life, how am I living in response to my relationship with God? Because we have a limited time here. It, it, it's true of everyone in this room that one day we will expire. It's true of everyone in this room that um, we will lose people. Wisdom is the art of living skillfully in whatever actual condition we find ourselves. It has nothing to do with a college degree or an accredited certificate that you may gain. It has nothing to do with the information you obtain or you get. Wisdom has to do with becoming skillful and honoring our parents and raising our children, handling our money, conducting our lives, um, going to work and exercising leadership, using words well and treating people kindly, eating and drinking in a way that would, be, that would honor the Lord, Cultivating emotions and attitudes towards others that make peace. You can say that's wise. Verse 2 tells us, when we look at it, in its context, sorry. Now I, gotta, I have my notes all organized. <laughs> when we look at it to its, in its context, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand the word of insight. What does this mean? To the Hebrew mind, wisdom was not knowledge alone, but the skill of living a godly life as God intended man to live. In other words, the way we think, the way we live, should be in response to who God is. It's the most practical thing we can do. In matters of everyday practicality, nothing should take precedence over God. Absolutely nothing. Proverbs is a section of the Bible known as wisdom literature. The other books in this section are Job, Psalm, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. The focus of these books is instructing men on how to live in light of who the Lord is, in his service, in his worship. The book of Proverbs is a collection of teachings of Solomon to his son or sons, showing the young man how to live in a matter that was pleasing to God. To fully understand Proverbs, it is important to define four key terms used throughout the book. And you will hear me use the fear of the Lord or fear a lot, but we're going to unpack that in just a bit. These words are often used interchangeably in English, but in the book of Proverbs, they tend to have individual meaning. And these four terms are learning, knowledge, wisdom, understanding. Learning, knowledge, wisdom, understanding. Learning. Learning is used in Proverbs, and it is the simple acquisition of information. For those of you who know me that I'm going uh, uh, to my union trade school on Saturdays uh, and it's to try to get my refrigeration engineer certificate or license. Right now I am learning, I am gathering information. This is the gathering of information that you would get if you're, let's say, going to a destination for one time, you're not gonna use it again. So, you know, back in the day, not, I'm, I know I'm speaking to Gen Zers and Millennials. You guys put it all on the phone. But back in the day, you had to go to MapQuest. Who remembers that? Or, or okay, I'm going to do you one better. You pick up the Atlas at the rest stop. And you needed a co-pilot to ride with you. Where are we? Take this left. Take this right. Now it's, it's easy. You just punch it in your phone, punch it in your car. Boom, it's there. You know, 
But this, the learning part is the gaining information for the purpose of a one-time use, right? That's learning, learning a destination, a phone number. How many people know a phone number off the top of their head right now? A few. I, re I still remember my grandmother's phone number, 8675309. No, that is not, <laughs> that is not her number. That's the, that's the song. <laughs> I'm not going to say her number because I don't want you guys to go and call it and then, you know. <laughs> but, you know, for me, that, that wasn't just learned information. That was, that was something that I would use later, perhaps to get me out of a jam. It was a, 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 a place of security and safety, right? So this is learning, something that you gain and you're not going to use anymore. You move on. Knowledge, on the other hand, so where learning is a short-term, you put that in your short-term memory bank, knowledge, you put it in your long-term memory bank. So knowledge is moved from short-term to long-term memory bank. In other words, it is useful information that you will use later on, right? Wisdom, so we got learning, we got knowledge, and we got wisdom. Wisdom is the capacity for action produced because of knowledge. In other words, just because you know something doesn't make you wise. It doesn't make one wise to gain information. What makes one wise is the application of that information. So we live in the information age. Information is real easy to get. Hey, Google. Hey, Siri. Right away, you got that information. But not often do we apply the right information. And then if we don't do that, we're ignorant. Ignorant doesn't mean stupid, it just means lacking the knowledge or the information. But wisdom is the capacity to produce, that's produced because of knowledge. Solomon asks for wisdom so that he can govern God's people. God acknowledges that wisdom given to Solomon was purely given to him because Solomon said, look, I don't want, God asked him, what do you want? I want wisdom to lead your people. Beautiful. But because you did not ask me for riches and anything else and, 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 and the plunders of war, or whatever, I'm gonna make you not only the wisest man, but the wealthiest man on the face of the earth. But note that what God did for Solomon is not something that he would do to just any old body. James tells us that whoever lacks wisdom, we should do what? Right? But exercising wisdom is an ability. It's not guaranteed. Because we all have the information in front of us. Pastor Andy preaches Sunday in and out, every Sunday. And the information is pumped out to us. The word of God is there in front of us. But how many times do we apply the actual lessons learned? That's something that we need to ask ourselves. Solomon passed, had possessed extraordinary wisdom. But then we see in the book of Ecclesiastes how I can't get through the first three chapters without crying when I read the book of Ecclesiastes. I can't. Chapter one, I start to think. Chapter two, I start to fidget a bit. Chapter three, I'm undone. Because I'm like, man, that's, that's, that's me. I'm a foolish dude. But Ecclesiastes shows us that he didn't always apply the wisdom that God had given him. So then we, we, we go from learning to knowledge to wisdom to now finally understanding. So understanding is now that I have, I've learned, I've acquired this wisdom, I've applied it, or I haven't, even in my mistakes, now what I do is, Trenton, I don't want you to make the same mistake I did. Let me show you and teach you why you shouldn't. See that? That's understanding. 
I understand where I find myself. I understand um, the consequences of my sin, or I understand the consequences of my disobedience. So I understand the reward of managing my finances well, managing my health well. Proverbs is best understood in the context with the book of Ecclesiastes and Job. In Proverbs, wisdom is given in short, simple, general terms. Ecclesiastes represents wisdom based on observations and experiences. That's what we see Solomon reflecting on the past and reflecting on everything, reflecting not just on his sin and the consequences thereof, but reflecting also on the goodness of God to bring him out of that and restore him. Right? The book of Job represents wisdom based on experiences of suffering and injustice, but all three come to the conclusion that God indeed knows best. And the most sensible course of action is to follow God's will. But if there is a key verse to unlock the power behind all of this is verse seven. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fools despise knowledge and instruction. And this is a subject that's not touched much in churches today. The fear of the Lord. Back in the day, it was preached very law heavy, law, uh, hellfire and brimstone. Today is preached very uh, hyper grace, antinomianism a lot. You live however you want to live. It's okay. God loves you. But today we're going to talk about what does it mean to fear the Lord? Verse 7, we see the progression. Again, like I just broke down. Teaching of God, learning of God, fearing God, knowing God, imitating God's wisdom. The fear of the Lord is a state of mind in which one's own attitudes, will, feelings, deeds, and goals are exchanged for God's. The fear of the Lord. This is a vital line throughout the book of Proverbs, as it is mentioned roughly 18 times throughout its pages. And all the, fr the phrase can be found 27 times throughout the entire Bible. And so much emphasis is placed on the fear of the Lord. And I believe that's where we need to start. So point one, a definition of the fear of the Lord. A definition of the fear of the Lord. What does the phrase, the fear of the Lord, refer to? When we think of fear, we associate the word with terror. Those of you who know me know that I'm very much afraid of rats. <laughs> and you would say, well, why do you live in New York City? That's a great question. <laughs> but I am. I don't like them. They, uh, they, I, I, I just don't like them, you know? <laughs> um, Webster defines fear as a feeling of anxiety, agitation produced by the presence of nearness of danger, evil, pain, etc. Some of you have a fear of public speaking. So do I. Go figure. Um, some of us have a fear of heights, a fear, so many fears. But what does the fear of the Lord mean? For many, this word fear would describe the feeling you get when you see a snake or you go to the doctor, go to a dentist. I'm afraid of rats. I love the dentist. I do. It relaxes me. Be like, bro, you're pretty sadistic. What are you talking about? You love the dentist. I do. I just, I like the dentist. But some people, they hate the dentist. It, it provokes fear in them. So the word fear, it is dread of the unknown. But surely this isn't what the Bible is referring to, right? It can't be. This is not the sensation the writer of Proverbs is referring to. The word fear the Lord are probably the most misunderstood words in our human minds because it goes straight to terror. Who has been to the Grand Canyon? Niagara Falls. I went to Niagara Falls. And when I went to Niagara Falls, um, well, first, Luce and I went to Mexico last year. Um, when we get to Mexico, we get to the hotel, to the resort lobby, and it's a beautiful sunny day. It's gorgeous. 
At a distance, it sounds like thundering, like really loud thundering. And Lou says, oh, honey, we can go to the beach. And I said, ah, no, it sounds like it's going to rain. And the person checking us in goes, no, that's not rain. That's the beach. What do you mean that's the beach? Yeah, those are the waves at the beach. Said it sounds like thunder. Say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's the beach. That's why nobody could swim here. Said, no, I don't believe you. Lucy and I, we go, we take a look. Sure enough, the sheer power and force of the ocean crashing on the shore was enough to, and I'm a pretty decent swimmer, but even I was like, nah, I'm not doing that. Take, now go to Niagara Falls. I hear the falls from a distance. And you're like, man, that sounds awesome. You don't even see them yet. Then you get closer and you see this majestic power, uncontained, and you start to even like your heart starts to beat faster, especially when you do the mate of the mist when you go on the boat. How many people know what I'm talking about? You get on the boat and you go as close to the falls as you possibly can. If a sermon didn't make you repent, that will. <laughs> because you know the power, the awesome might that's behind those falls. And then they do the tour, Mark. I don't know if you did, if you did the tour behind the falls where they took, and you feel this pounding in your chest. See, that's the fear this is talking about. It's not necessarily terror, but it's respect. When I see those falls, when I saw the ocean, I know what it's capable of doing, and I'm just in awe over it. Like the text we read for scripture reading, the smoldering fire in the mountain, and the Lord did this on purpose to provoke something in the people so that they can see I'm bigger and more terrifying than anything you can face. But I love what the Lord did in the wilderness. Not only did he show him that side of himself, he also shows a side of caring, loving, nurturing, taking care of them. And that's what we have in a father. So when we talk about the fear of the Lord, we're talking about reverence. Oh, respect. We could be in the presence of celebrities or somebody and we geek out. Oh, oh my God. Taylor Swift. <laughs> I thank the Lord that, um, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm sure I'll geek out over certain people. I ain't even gonna mention names, but the point is this. A lot of times we have more reverence for other human beings than we do the Lord. So the fear of the Lord means respect of the Lord. It means his followers are being aware of what is right and wrong and making a conscious effort to avoid evil. As believers, we want to obey and be pleasing in his sight. The fear of the Lord is that affectionate reverence by which the child of God bends himself humbly and carefully to the Father's law, as we read during scripture reading. The Lord, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do the other. It wasn't because he was being a killjoy, it was those were his parameters by which he was protecting them and us. So what the writer of this book is saying is that we are to have a deep reverence and respect for the Lord. Literally, we are to be awed and humbled by... <gasps> wow. When we truly fear the Lord, we will recognize that he is the creator and we are the creatures that he is the father and we are the children. When a child loves his dad, I love what Andy said a couple of weeks ago when he was talking about, I think it was a small group. So he was playing with baby Andrew and baby Andrew was wrestling him and, and baby Andrew's mind, he probably thinks that he's stronger than Andy. Okay. 
Like when I used to let my son win until one day he really beat me. (laughs) He jumped for joy and he started literally crying. He was about 15. We used to wrestle. We used to wrestle until he was about 16 years old, grappling, wrestling. And and he put me in a rear naked choke one day (laughs) and I tapped out. Andy, he was ecstatic to the point that he cried. Because in his mind, he's like, this this is Superman. I just did this. But when we think of the Lord, we know we can never do that. We know that he can crush us like this. But that's not what drives us to obedience. What drives us to obedience is that loving, affectionate relationship that we have with him. Why do we love the Lord? Thank you. That's what I wanted you to say. I had to hear my notes. We love him because he first loved us. It's not anything we conjured up in our own minds or anything that we did, right? The fear of the Lord is deep-seated reverence for God that causes men to want to please him at all costs. Genuine, Genuine fear of the Lord is always seen in obedience to his word. Genuine fear of the Lord is always seen in obedience to his word. Rebel sinners do not fear the Lord, regardless of what they profess with their lips. I come from a, from a Dominican or Caribbean culture, and especially Latinos. No, hay que temerle a Dios. You got to fear the Lord. You got to fear the Lord. Mind you, doing everything and anything, right? But that's the rebel sinner. The rebel sinner will say that they fear the Lord, but a person cannot truly walk in the fear of the Lord, lest they are submitted and also redeemed by the Lord himself. It's impossible. You may have life experiences that you can share with everyone else, but if wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord, how can that person have true wisdom? Because ultimately, They may have knowledge in an area or a subject, and that's great. But remember what the purpose of Solomon's instructions are to his son, is to live his life in light of who God is. It's not to diversify your portfolio. It's not to get a six-pack abs. Those things are great if you can if you can, at least the abs. Um, But it's to live your life poured out to the Lord. So this reverential, awe-inspiring, submissive fear is fundamental for all spiritual knowledge and wisdom. Would you describe your life as one lived in the fear of the Lord? Does the dread of his wrath prompt you to holiness? Even better, does, the, does his grace, mercy, lead you to see his love for you? Does respect for him and for his will propel you, propel you towards obedience and godliness? So the fear of the Lord, point one. the definition of it. Point two, if that's the definition or the definition of what the fear of the Lord is, then point two brings us to the benefits of the fear of the Lord. Because that's how chapter one is broken down. So then there's instruction and there is a careful um, walking through This is why you shouldn't do these things, right? But before we get to, and which again, Pastor Andy would have me um, finish this at a later date as we keep going through this uh, short series, we will see what the consequences of not walking in the fear of the Lord look like. But before we get to there, I want to look at the benefits of walking in the fear of the Lord. So verse seven, it is the beginning 
beginner of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So here are the benefits. That's one. Proverbs 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Proverbs 15, 33. The fear of the Lord is instruction and wisdom and humility comes before honor. The best place to begin to search for true wisdom is in the fear of the Lord. The true fear of the Lord is born out of knowledge of how infinitely powerful, majestic, and full of goodness God is. Before you can grow in the Lord, one must learn to fear the Lord. In other words, respect him. So the benefit is that we gain knowledge when we, when we learn who God is. We gain wisdom. When we gain this wisdom, number two, it motivates us to holy, to holy living. Again, wisdom applied, like I said in the beginning. Chapter three, verse seven. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Chapter 16, verse 6. By steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. And by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. In other words, his works, his works on the cross, his finished work on the cross. That's what allows us to not only be regenerated, but is by walking in the fear of the Lord, by walking, being indwelt by the Holy Spirit, we are able to turn away from evil. This verse tells us that the fear of the Lord promotes holy living. The person who truly reverences and respects the Lord as he should will not do anything to disgrace this honor or pain the heart of the Lord. Now, this doesn't please, this isn't a blanket statement. It is not to say that we won't have pitfalls and shortcomings. That's not what I'm saying. Because as a man standing before you, I can tell you, and for those of you who know me, and those of you who know me well, know that I have made many foolish mistakes. Many. And I am only here by the grace of God. So this isn't, this isn't a plug and play type of thing. Do this and this will happen. That's not what I'm saying. But Job is a great example of, of this. Job is a great example of what the fear of the Lord will produce in your life. Remember when God speaks to Satan and he says, have you considered my faithful servant Job? There is none like him, blameless and upright. I've always read that and I'm like, man, God, that's not right, man. That's not, that's not you set him up. <laughs> but I've always said, man, would God say that about me? Would God speak about me that way? So two, it motivates people to holiness. Three, it prolongs life, the fear of the Lord. We're going through the benefits. And again, this is an introduction for the more broader, deeper message throughout the series. It prolongs life. I just want to say this. Um, why even speak about these things now? When I survey the room and I survey PVC, one of the things that I've noticed is besides your love and your affection and, and just your genuine love for God, what I also see is, is a younger crowd, which is perfectly fine. That being said, I feel compelled to talk about these things to remind especially the younger folks and this apply to young and old but especially the younger folks in this room your life you have so many decisions of ahead of you that you need to make but it's when you walk in the fear of the lord trusting and depending fully on the holy spirit for those life decisions 
Some of you have decisions about courtship, marriage, jobs, where you will live, where you will, uh, um, you know, who you're going to associate yourselves with. And a lot of these decisions aren't decisions that you should take lightly. They're not. Yes, God is gracious and merciful. But I'm a firm believer that you don't have to go through something to learn a lesson. You can see the mistakes that others have created or have made and learn from that. Just want to take a pause and insert that there. Number three, it prolongs life. Chapter 10, verse 27. The fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be short. Another one that's not a blanket statement. This isn't plug and play. We know that throughout life, there are many things that can affect us because we live in a fallen world. There are many Christians who die young. There are many Christians who are martyred and, and, and suffer. We know this. This isn't what I'm talking about here, and it's not what the scripture is talking about. What is generally speaking of is those who live in the fear of the Lord will typically grow outside of barring any sickness, disease, or something that may, will typically grow to a ripe old age in comparison to those who live with reckless abandon. You see that? So, so if, I'm, if I'm young or old, single or married, and I decide to live a promiscuous life or abuse alcohol or just abuse nicotine or whatever the case is, the chances of me expiring increase exponentially. We see this and we see this everywhere. We see this, you look at places like Chicago, the Bronx, you see young men, 13, 14, 15, 16 years old, being murdered. because they choose to live a life of gang violence. Now, the chances of a non-gang banger living an older age versus the one who's a gang banger, how do you think it's gonna go? So that's what this refers to. It prolongs life. Approximately 60% of illnesses can be traced directly or indirectly to fear, sorrow, Envy, resentment, guilt. You ever gone through something where you've, where, where, where you've been so angry at someone, you feel it in, your, in the pit of your stomach? It doesn't feel good. It actually, it, when I get like that, I feel like my, my wife and I, we have this thing. When, whenever we feel that way, we always be like, you look so ugly when you're angry. <laughs> and it's true because you get the scroll on your face and... And the other person said sorry and everything, but you still <sighs> huffing and puffing. The amount of energy it exerts out of your body versus just saying, we're at peace, we're good. So you see how the fear of the Lord prolongs life? Why? Because instead of anger and hatred and envy, what's the fruit of the spirit? Joy, peace. Loving kind, oh, come on. <laughs> and it's not to say that as Christians, we're not, righteous anger is a thing, and we are to be, to have that. And it's not to say that we're not gonna have bad days. That's not what I'm saying. But those who go out of their way to live outside of the fear of the Lord, their chances of suffering certain things more than those who, again, Psoriasis of the liver, emphysema, emphysema, cancer, heart disease, sexual immorality that produces venereal diseases. And but we know brothers and sisters who have gone through sickness and disease. So again, not a blanket statement. But can we see, we see that life lived in the fear of the Lord with obedience to his word will result in a much healthier existence for the most part. Not, again, not counting those who 
because of the fallen nature of humanity, we're susceptible to sickness, disease, miscarriages. It's not what I'm talking about. Number four, it produces a sense of security, does the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 14, 26, in the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence. His children will have a refuge. Reverencing the Lord builds confidence. No difficult circumstance or personal circumstance or anything that's happening in this world should alarm us. Oh, we're going to be so much better off if this candidate wins. And we're going to be so much better off if that candidate wins. Uh, Listen, I get what you're saying. But at the end of the day, your life is not in either of those candidates' hands. Your life is in the Lord. Period. Yes, exercise wisdom and vote accordingly. But understand that ultimately your life belongs to the Lord. God is in control. When we are walking in the fear of the Lord, we can have confidence that God is on our side. What does Romans 8.31 say? If God is for us, the person who is walking in the fear of the Lord and is living by his word will have fewer feelings of insecurity, abandonment, and fear. And if you don't, I urge you on the tab, please book an appointment with Pastor Andy for pastoral care. If you're having doubts about your security in the Lord, if you're having doubts that God loves you, if you're having doubts about the gospel, we are here to talk to you about those things so that you can understand that, yes, you are loved. Yes, you are accepted. Yes, you are a child of God. But you also need to understand that when I do something to break God's law, to break God's commandments, and I am not walking in the fear of the Lord, now I am alienated from the presence of my father. But how good is God? First John, that if we confess our sins, what does he do? Come on back in. Come on back in. That's the God we serve. That's the God we have. I stopped saying whenever I would sin or stumble, fall, however you want to call it, it's sin. (laughs) Man, I'm not saved. Am I saved? I'm not even saved no more. Because I began to see his gracious, saving grace towards me. I began to see it in light of my works. What am I doing? What am I not doing? When I started seeing it in light of his works, it's by the finished work of Christ. Robert Murray McShane, for every look at your sin, take look at Christ. Every time you focus on your sin, you look at your sin, you look in that mirror and you look at your sin one time, take 10 looks at the cross of Christ. Because that's where he nailed our sin. So it produces life. The fear of the Lord is abundant life that no, that one may turn away from the snares of death. Trusting in the Lord as Savior brings abundant life or everlasting life. Also, honoring God results in refreshing purpose and of refreshing purposeful life. The believer does not wander aimlessly through life. We know what our purpose is. To have God and enjoy him fully. We know what our purpose is. We know what we were created for. Instead, he progresses through life like a runner whose eyes is on the goal of finishing well. He runs the race with his eyes focused on who? Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus. Six, it makes all of life better. Proverbs 15, 16, better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble within. Solomon compares two situations, living with material wealth, but knowing, living without material wealth, but knowing and honoring God versus 
being prosperous and suffering the consequences of a godless life. He is not saying that prosperity is wrong. Please believe. Please believe. That's not what he's saying. But what he is saying is this. He's not saying that the goal of life is to have wealth either or health or fun or pleasure. He is saying that the goal is to have the Lord. He is the true treasure that we are to have. What is it that Jesus says in Matthew 6, 25 through, through 33? Seek first and it's, and what will happen? Who's the primary thing there? God. Seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. What righteousness? Christ. Number seven, it produces satisfaction and safety. Proverbs 19, 23, the fear of the Lord leads to life and whoever has it, it rests satisfied. He will not be visited by harm. A proverb is a short general case statement of wisdom. Unlike prophecies or commands, proverbs are not absolute. So much like when a doctor tells a patient, eat well and exercise, you will live longer. That advice isn't always promise. We know bodybuilders and people who work out and take care of their bodies, unfortunately, can come down with any form of illness and sickness. I know people who don't take care of their bodies at all and live to a ripe old age. But, you know, but healthy exercise can still, as healthy athletes can still suffer accidents and illnesses, but probably not as often as those who ignore the doctor's advice. The statement is not a magical pill. In other words, if you do this, this will work out. But like I said, with the gang members, the young men who live with reckless abandon or the people who live with reckless abandon, chances of you expiring sooner are greater. They increase. But notice this verse also says that that person will not be visited by evil. The person who walks in the genuine fear of the Lord don't fear going to hell. Because Romans 8, 1 tells us that there is now what? For those who what? Who walk according to the? That's it. So not only does it produce life and prolongs life, but it also gives us safety. There's a promise. To walk in the fear of the Lord is going to have to be your individual decision. It's a choice that we make. Solomon had it all before him. He, he had God's counsel. He exercised, he, he applied wisdom for time. But as we will see later on, when he walked not in the fear of the Lord, the consequences were dire. And by him not walking in the fear of the Lord, that set in motion decades and centuries of God's wrath upon Israel. No one can make us do any of this thing, any of this stuff. It's our decision. The Holy Spirit prompts you to walk in the fear of the Lord. If you love the Lord, you will, you will have a, a, a desire for him, for his word. If that's not you, my prayer is that you would ask God, Lord, increase, help me walk in holiness. Help me honor you every day, God. Give me a hunger and a spirit for righteousness. The decision to live a life that is ordered around a holy reverential respect for God is a decision that you must make for yourself. 
All we can do is tell you what the word of God says. A decision to walk outside of the fear of the Lord brings dire consequences. Even as a believer, if you truly belong to the Lord, God will eventually convict you of your sin. And that is for the purpose of leading you to restoration or bringing you to restoration. Because our sin not only affects us privately, but it affects us corporately. It affects my fellowship with my pastor, with my brethren, with God. A life lived outside of the fear of the Lord will tell on us. If you are a non-believer and you're visiting us today, you may be an expert in many things, But what God would have you know today is that all the knowledge in the world means nothing if we don't have knowledge of him. Not just knowledge of him, but if we don't apply that knowledge in the sense of submitting to his authority as Lord and Savior. Tomorrow is not promised to me. Tomorrow is not promised to you. Today can very well be the last day on earth for any one of us. And I know that sounds heavy and it is. And that's very bad news for those who are without Christ. Because those who are without Christ don't think that we hear and then when we die, that's it. This here on earth is a pit stop for us. Our time on earth is much shorter than what our eternity will be outside of earth. My son asked me one time, what if everything in the Bible is fake? I said, well, if everything in the Bible is fake and I live my life for Christ and we do get to an afterlife, you and everyone else are going to be laughing at me. Thankfully, God gave me a good sense of humor and thick skin. I think I can go through eternity with people laughing at me. But if the Bible is real, which I believe and I know it to be true, eternity is a long time for you to reflect on how wrong you were. But that's not where it ends. God is so gracious that he would have you be here today and hear his invitation to come to the foot of the cross and place your trust on Jesus. Because no matter how hard we think we could walk in the fear of the Lord, we still get it wrong. But he is the only one who obeyed the law perfectly the only one who truly walked in the fear of the Lord, the one who was our sacrificial lamb to atone for our sin. Come to Jesus. No salvation and walk in the fear of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. 
how refreshing it is to remind us that you are a holy God, a gracious God, an awesome, mighty God. Lord, as holy as you are, that there is no one and nothing like you, you still made the decision to create humanity in your image and likeness. Lord, and even though sin entered the world to one man, that man named Adam. Salvation came to the world through another man, the God-man, Jesus. And scripture says that it is for your love of humanity that you send him so that all who will believe on him would have everlasting life. So God, I pray that in light of that sacrifice, in light of that love, in light of that grace, that we may conduct our lives and live our lives in a way that would be pleasing and acceptable before you. Lord, help us understand that what we do privately when no one else is looking, you are there. Help us understand, my God, that walking in the fear of the Lord and walking in the freedom of Christ produces life. There's so many things that we are to enjoy, beginning with you, continuing with our brothers and sisters in the faith and being here today in fellowship and worship. Lord, examine our hearts this morning. Just like you told Israel that you would remove the heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Lord, we ask, my God, that you may purge us, cleanse us. Give us a heart for righteousness. Help us make decisions with wisdom and discernment that we may please you. I pray for those who don't know you, that they may come to know you, that they may understand that a life outside of your will, outside of the fear of the Lord, outside of you, who, who is the safety net, is nothing but doom and destruction and eternal condemnation. That they may see how gracious and loving you are that you have extended your grace to them by giving them another day, that they may hear that you are a loving, holy, gracious God who invites sinners to come to you and be restored. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.